Hey folks, it's Andrew Kilpatrick here, and welcome to part four of my series about MIDI. Uh, this part is going to talk about the structure of messages, and then in the future episodes, we're going to talk about the actual messages themselves and the way the data works and everything like that. But we need to understand a little bit about the structure of how messages are put together uh, before we can fully understand how to use them in actual real-world uh, uses. So let's go and have a look at the topics for today. This is part four. Basically, we're going to talk about the status byte and how that works. We're going to talk about running status and what that is. It's basically a form of compression, but it works in an interesting way. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the difference between channel messages and system messages. So let's go over to the bench as usual and we'll have a look at some, uh, some information. So this is a page from the actual MIDI spec. Um, the MIDI spec, you can freely download it from the MIDI Manufacturers Association, which is at midi.org. Um, but not all parts of the spec are very clear. And I've actually had to sort of read between the lines a few times and sort of try to figure out what the designers were really talking about. Um, some examples aren't very clear or they're a little bit ambiguous. Um, but there's other parts of the spec that are quite clear. And these little diagrams here are a pretty good indication of the sort of top-down details of how messages work in MIDI. So I thought instead of reinventing the wheel, let's just take a look at this right away. So there's two kinds of bytes in MIDI, status bytes and data bytes. And so most of the numbers that you're going to see in the spec for MIDI are shown in hexadecimal, although we sort of bounce back and forth. And I've, I'm sure you've even noticed in some software that there's sort of a difference between sometimes uh, hexadecimal numbers are shown, sometimes decimal numbers are shown. Um, and if you're not familiar with hexadecimal, it's a really quite simple thing that makes a lot of sense in computing um, because it works with powers of two. Um, and so basically each of these digits here, or characters I guess, because they don't, they're not just always numbers, can have a range instead of 0 through 9 like we would have with a normal decimal number, it can be 0 through F. So here's the quick primer on, on hexadecimal um, and also binary because that's really an easy way to think about hexadecimal is to look at it in terms of bits. So each of these digits represents four bits and four bits is half a byte and that's actually called a nibble. So let's say we've got four bits right here and four more bits. This is a byte and each of these is a nibble, nibble, N-I-B-B-L-E. Um, and so each of these is represented by only one character in a hexadecimal number. And that's really good because it means that there's always one character that can represent all the possible values of, of uh, these four bits. And instead of going 0 through 9 like we would in a regular number, we go 0 through F which basically means 16 different combinations, which are the 16 ways that these ones and zeros could be set, these bits can be set. So each of these could be a one or a zero. So that's a really quick way to think about, uh, about hexadecimal and binary and how that kind of relates. And that's an important point because status bytes in MIDI are special in that they always have the most significant bit, which is the one in the left hand place, so this is MSB and LSB. And obviously just like in regular numbers where we'd have ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, etc., in binary we have one, two, four, eight, and we can keep counting over 16, 32, 64, 128, but if you want to think in terms of nibbles, we have one, two, four, eight, and then it's repeated again. These have a higher value, obviously. So there's lots of different ways to sort of imagine it. I sort of imagine things in binary most of the time when I'm thinking about um, protocols and, and the way things work in terms of uh, looking at bits and so on. It's, a, it's, it's easy, but if you think of groups of four bits as being a hexadecimal digit, then it's really easy to convert back and forth and type things in when you're programming and stuff like that. So 
The basic idea of a status byte is that it's got this most significant bit always set to 1. And that's really important because it means that without any other information about what's going on, if we receive a byte, and remember that in MIDI we talked about the fact that, that the receiver is really sort of byte oriented. Bytes are sort of separate entities and they can come at any time. Um, and basically, when you receive a byte, you sort of have to know, based on ones that you've received before or not, you need to know what it's all about and what it means. So if I receive a byte and it has the most significant bit set, then I know right away that it's a status byte. And I can look through the various status bytes, compare the other bits, and say, oh, I know what this is. If I get a byte that doesn't have the most significant bit set, then I know that it's a data byte and it's part of another message and then I can figure out what to do with that data, whether the data belongs to some message that we expect to be receiving or maybe not. So uh, th that's the reason why the range of numbers that are used for the data bytes can only go from 00 to 7f and that would be 00 would be all these bits set to 0 and 7f would be this would be F, all these bits are set, and then this would be 7, only three of these bits would be set, because remember this top bit is reserved. And then the status byte, of course, has to have this most significant bit set, so it has the same range of values, except it's raised up by 128 um, in terms of its magnitude, because it starts with this, this most significant bit set, and all the other bits can be any one of 128 combinations. And the status bytes equal all the kinds of messages that we can receive, whether they're channel messages, uh, system messages, and so on. Those are all encoded in this range of values here. Um, and then down here, there's a sort of breakdown of different kinds of messages. The, the ones down at the very lowest um, level in this tree I don't really think of, of MIDI with that sort of granularity usually because uh, what you'll find is if you sort of look through the categories in the MIDI spec, you'll find that although they do make sense the way that these are sort of labeled, they don't really fit together that way in the way that you normally use MIDI. And so I try to, I sort of group them a little bit differently. Um, and we'll go through that in, in, in future episodes. Um, so let's talk about. Um, the actual format of the data, and this is uh, the next page actually uh, from the MIDI spec as well, and there's basically two kinds of messages. There's single messages, they call them here. Um, in some programming libraries they call those simple messages, which are basically just either one, two, or three bytes. Notice that there's always a status byte at the beginning, followed by one or two data bytes, or sometimes followed by no other bytes, because sometimes the status byte is all the information we need. Um, an example of that would be like a clock tick, where we know that time has elapsed, and the, the simple fact that we received that status byte means that we know what that is. There's no other information that has to be taken uh, or sent along with it. And then there's a special kind of message called a system exclusive message. This is for sending manufacturer specific data, so things like firmware updates, uh, patch dumps, things that are specific to a product, and maybe there's some software on the computer that wants to talk to the product, things like that. Usually if you look in the back of a manual for a product that supports MIDI, you'll find some of these um, uh, specified and sort of the layout of how they work. Uh, and they're a little bit different because they can have a status byte and then they can have any number of data bytes. There is a sort of minimum number, but they could have, you know, like a few data bytes all the way up to thousands or as many as you want. And then there's a special message at the end that says this is finished. There's no more, the system ex exclusive message is done. And that looks like a status byte, but it's actually not used that way. In this case, it's sort of a message, a marker that says uh, end of exclusive. That's what EOX means. So that's basically the, the two general types of messages. Most messages that we use in MIDI are of this type. And in fact, if you look in bug reports and change logs for MIDI software and MIDI hardware like MIDI interfaces and things, you'll find that system exclusive, even though this protocol is really old, 
uh, it's still a source of frustration and problems uh, on a lot of systems, and it's it's kind of hard to deal with in in uh, some some respects. And you'll find still that there's products that don't deal with it correctly. So now let's talk about running status because this is a really interesting part of MIDI. And it's something that uh, when I first started developing MIDI software uh, and MIDI hardware, I didn't really fully understand what this was all about. I would sort of come across it and I didn't really understand what to do with it. And uh, if you're sending MIDI, it's not a really big deal. You won't really have a problem with it. But if you're receiving MIDI, especially at the byte level, uh, not necessarily uh, in, in software on your computer because usually the data gets processed by the operating system and other drivers. But if you're making things with like, let's say, Arduinos or microcontrollers of some sort and you're just receiving the raw bytes from a MIDI cable, then you need to understand running status and what it, what it means because uh, otherwise you will run into problems. And that's what happened to me. I was, I didn't know that I had to deal with that and I wrote some really naive code and then it didn't work all the time. Sometimes it worked and other times it didn't work and I was very confused. And then I went back and reread the MIDI spec and learned what uh, my mistake was and realized that I needed to think about running status. So it's good to look through the spec, it's good to experiment with things, but uh, ultimately you really want, especially when you're receiving MIDI, you want your device or your code or whatever to be able to fully implement MIDI properly so that no matter what you plug into your device, it will work properly. Uh, so running status is kind of a, an interesting form of compression and compression is used in sort of like, it's, that sounds really high tech and like, uh, you know, JPEGs or MP3 or things like that, but that's not really what it is. It's just a really simple way of Sol or, or of, of reducing the amount of data that needs to be sent. Uh, so an example would be a keyboard where you're playing a bunch of notes one after another. And let's say you're going to hold down a big chord. You are going to send basically a bunch of messages that basically all have the same status byte to start. They might say note on and then they have a note number and a velocity. But if you send multiples of those notes, there's a way that you can save the amount of data that you have to send over the MIDI cable by omitting that status byte on the second and then subsequent messages. As long as the status byte remains the same, and this doesn't work for all kinds of messages, but most messages, channel messages it works for, where you can basically assume, uh, the receiver has to assume that if it starts getting more data bytes without a status byte, that the previously received status byte will be the same. And so we call that running status. Um, and that basically just means that whatever status we have, it's still running. It's still, it's still valid. Um, and so that's something important. And remember in a, pr in a previous video, we talked about the fact that uh, MIDI is, it it requires a lot of state to be stored on the receiving side. And this is a perfect example of um, of what that's all about because not only do you need to remember the previous bytes in a message, you need to remember all the state of the system in terms of what controllers are happening or what, what the latest value is, what notes are playing or not playing, um, and things like that. Uh, you also need to remember previous messages that you've received and, for instance, what status byte was used in the last message and so on. So that's running status. And then the only thing we're going to talk about, um, which I'll actually go back to this other page, just to briefly touch on here, is the difference between channel and system messages and in terms of what, what the status byte actually means in those kinds of messages. So for channel messages, these are the messages that start from 8.0 to E.F. That's the sort of, if you want to talk about this kind of this range of numbers here, 8.0 to EF is the range of, of uh, status bytes that's used for channel messages. And in these kinds of messages, the first or the more significant nibble, let's say the top four bits of this message, is the message type. It basically says what kind of message it is. Is it a note on, a note off, some control change, whatever. 
The least significant nibble, the lower four bits, is the channel number. And that's why MIDI has 16 channels, because within these four bits we can encode 16 different values. But in system messages, because system messages are global and they don't have a channel, all the values from F0 to F, F are used. And in fact, those are not all actually assigned. There's some that are not used. Um, but generally, all those values, and in this case, the entire byte is the command or is the status byte. And it, uh, each of those is unique. There is no channel number. And all of those are able to be used to say things to encode the various kinds of system messages. So that's basically it for part four. Um, I uh, hope that was a, a good sort of quick overview of the, the format of the messages. And in the next parts, we're going to talk about channel messages and we're going to talk about MIDI clock and SysX. And those are, those are the details of the actual data that gets sent and how you actually use the MIDI uh, messages to actually do real things within your system. So I hope that you found this interesting and uh, join us for the next part. See ya.